Hey, Connexus Church, Mark Clark here. Glad that you are part of this Versus series. We are talking about ideas that go up against one another. And today we're doing creation versus evolution. Now, what's interesting about this one is uh, years ago, we as a church actually asked the internet, which is probably not, you know, great advice. Uh, what do you want me to preach on? And the internet got filled with a lot of requests and top five was this question of creation versus evolution. So it's still a thing. Uh, I remember when I first came to the church, I was 19 years old and I had kind of grown up in this secular atheistic world and I came in and it was such a big issue in the church. Everyone was kind of going crazy about this. Like, what do you think about this? What do you think about it? It became like the definitive issue of your faith. And I was like, oh my goodness, I better go look at this and try to figure it out. I remember that. I also remember when I first came into the church, I watched a debate between uh, one uh, theistic person, a, a person who believes in God and creation uh, in the way, the, the kind of classic traditional way it's taught, and a guy named Anthony Flew. And Anthony Flew was uh, one of the greatest, most respected philosophers of his time, and, and he was an atheist, and he was arguing in the debate for evolution, naturalistic evolution, and he basically said, God doesn't exist because naturalistic evolution is true, and God doesn't exist because evil, and God doesn't exist because there's no proof, and all these things. And he gave this very articulate debate. It became one of the most famous debates <clears throat> of the 80s. And then, just before Anthony Flew died uh, a few years ago, he actually wrote a paper saying, I've actually moved away from atheism and toward a theistic belief because of the evidence of what science actually provides, that the evidence actually moves me now toward believing in God. So why is that partly was because of this discussion about evolution and how much it can prove and not prove. And so let me begin by breaking down what we're talking about here. One of the questions that was raised during that time when we did that series as a church, is evolution compatible with the Adam and Eve story? And so let me, let me frame both those for you and then we'll dig into some data. And just remember, as we're hitting data and quotes, for some of you, this is going to be your favorite sermon of the series. Others of you, it's going to be the worst of the series. Well, you can blame Jeff, all right? He asked me to do this one. It's an important one, but it's a data and heavy-minded one, so hopefully you can stick with it, and we'll come back at the end and really try to uh, talk about what this has to do with Jesus and you and I and our faith in him. So, let me begin. What are these two stories? First, for those of you who are new to church, the Adam and Eve story. It's a story about God creating the world in six days, resting on the seventh, creating uh, light, moon, stars, plants, animals, water, human beings. And then it says this in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Then the Lord God formed the man out of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living creature. It is a beautiful image and there's much debate on what it actually means, how it can be interpreted, but that's generally the story as it's told in the Bible. And the other story is the evolutionary story. The evolutionary story was popularized by Charles Darwin in the 1800s, most popular. The Origin of Species is his book. And there's a few ideas that he put forth, which is that all living things come from one, it's called common ancestry, one thing, one uh, one celled amoeba, a living organism began to live and it started to multiply. And over millions of years, it adapted and, and, and a, a single celled amoeba became this, became an amphibian, became a reptile, became a mammal, became a bird, became, and over time, uh, natural selection happened where this one was stronger than that one. And so we have five fingers because of this and this species survives because it was able to beat out that one. All of these things, multiplied over millions of years and um, and we all come from one common ancestry and, and, and so the reality is um, you have this debate is this true did we come from one common ancestry is it natural uh, evolution where things evolve over time and, and actually move over different species and so one species becomes another becomes another and so literally a horse that's running around today came from a whale a whale slowly developed over time onto land became a horse. This was the theory of evolution as it was with Charles Darwin. And so the question becomes, are these two compatible ideas or do we need to do away with one or the other? And of course, this is a very popular debate, a very popular versus. Now, 
What do we do? Well, there are three basic views on this issue. Uh, the first view is what is called theistic evolution and, or, or evolutionary creationism, depending on what you call it. And it's espoused by guys like Dinesh D'Souza, Alistair McGrath, Francis Collins, Kenneth Miller. Francis Collins wrote The Language of God. He, he mapped out the human genome in the 90s. A pretty smart guy. And he, what he does, because he loves Jesus and he's a theistic evolutionist, he believes basically evolution happened um and uh and and god was involved in it uh and so the, instead of an atheistic version of it where it was unguided uh which is one of the tenets of uh darwinian evolution um Francis Collins and Kenneth Miller and these guys say, no, no, it was evolution basically, as Darwin said, but it's guided. It was guided from God from the beginning. And, uh, and, and, and Francis Collins is an interesting guy because he'll go into Harvard and he'll do these lectures and then he'll pull his guitar out and he'll sing songs about Jesus and people will come to faith. And yet he's one of the most respected. He just won the Templeton Prize recently. He's one of the most respected scholars in the world. And yet he's an evangelical Christian who loves Jesus and, uh, and tells people about faith all the time. And so um, it's a theistic evolution uh, construct, which is basically saying, look, um, there's no contradiction between these ideas at all. In fact, Genesis 2 verse 7 is one of the verses they would use, and they would say, look, God doesn't create Adam and Eve ex nihilo out of nothing. He creates them out of pre-existing material. He creates them out of the ground, and then he makes them. And so maybe this is kind of the evolutionary story uh, from being poetic. And that's one of the hermeneutics or the interpretive filters that evolutionary uh, theory would make if it wants to remain Christian, is they would say, Genesis Genesis 1 and 2, don't press it for every kind of scientific detail. It has poetic license. The point of Genesis 1 is not to actually get into the why and the how, it's the what. What happened at 30,000 feet? Okay, don't press it for any more details because the Bible tends to be poetic in the way that it talks about things anyway. So that, it, you know, in the Psalms, it talks about how God's going to cover us with his wings and we don't think God's a bird. So let's not out-Bible the Bible and make it say things or not say things it was never intended to say. That's the basic idea. They also point out the idea that, um, that Adam and Eve then would not be historical uh, people. That's actually uh, literalism that we don't need. We are connected to animals. Uh, and so they would say, this is what Christianity has always, in a sense, said. Aristotle said that human beings are basically uh, rational, reasonable animals and that we are actually connected. They would point out that... Um, because the critique oftentimes comes and says, look, how could we be connected to animals? It's not right because we're made in the image of God. They would point out that, yes, we can still be made in the image of God, but the point of being made in the image of God was never that we're made in the image like literally like God is six foot one and 170 pounds and has five fingers. That's never what that image of God has ever been about. It's all about we're moral, conscious beings who reflect the image of God out into the world, and they would say, Yes, there does come a point, according to Genesis 2, verse 7, where this, this existing thing that was going around was then at some point breathed into and made into the image of God, and that that's the poetic way of telling that story. That's what they would say. Um, they would also say, uh, they, they would cite uh, the great theologians throughout history, John Calvin, for instance, saying, look, the Bible's not a science textbook. It's not meant to give us every single detail about science. The Holy Spirit, Calvin said, had no intention to teach astronomy, all right? That the idea is, look, don't press every single sentence and every single word, especially in the opening chapters of Genesis, which seem to be poetic to begin with, to tell us everything about science. And the theistic message is, theistic evolutionary message, uh, message is, um, don't allow, the issue with evolution is not so much evolution itself. They would say the issue is a naturalistic version of it, an atheistic version of it. So they would say, everyone believes this anyway, so let's not let the atheists actually take evolution and hijack it for their own purposes, let's realize that evolution doesn't by default mean there is no God. Let's the theism, Christianity, hijack or, or understand evolution and all its beauty, they would say, and then use it to say this is actually evidence for God be, uh, existing. So uh, there's a second actual view on this then. So that's the first group.
The second group is the opposite. The second group is a group that says that view is by definition unbiblical. It's not right because when you read the Genesis story, God creates the world in six days. He creates humankind. He creates these things in the sixth day. There's no millions of years. He creates it according to its kind. And so there's no overlap with a horse never becomes a whale. A, a fish never becomes a... That overlap doesn't happen. Species remain within their species. And the Bible is very literal when it says... There's, uh, there's this generation and this generation. That means there's only 10,000 years. Okay, a lot of people would say that the world's 10, 11, 12, 15,000 years old because the genealogy in the Bible tells us that the world was created in six days and they reject any idea uh, of, of that, that contradicts a very literal interpretation of the Bible in that way. They would see it as almost um, against Jesus, in a sense, and they, they would espouse that you have to just take the Bible literally, take it for what it is. And of course, there are problems with that view around the idea of, well, there are times, of course, where our interpretation of the Bible isn't literal. You know, it, this is where the church has got into trouble history, saying the earth is flat because the Bible says the four corners of the earth, you know, and all these kind of things. So the reality is, this second group, second group says there's no uh, legitimacy to the first group. That the first group, by definition, believing in evolution means that you don't believe in the Bible because you got to read it literally and it doesn't have room for millions and millions of years of adaptation and common ancestry and so on. Okay, so there's a third group uh, which is somewhere in between. It says, of course, that uh, it, 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 take, it tries to take the best of both worlds. So if the, if the second group said one of the biggest critiques of the first group is that there's no literal Adam and Eve historically, the third group would go, no, no, there actually is an Adam and Eve historically, so let's hold on to that. But Genesis is literal in its meaning, but its details shouldn't be pressed. And so when we look at it, the Bible actually gives us, it isn't asking us to press every detail into a literal model. So it would point out this, an example, light in the Genesis story is made on day one, but plants and the sun and the moon aren't made until later, day three. So how can plants exist before, actually in the chronology, plants exist before the sun exists? Well, we know that photosynthesis is the thing that allows plants to grow. And if the sun didn't exist, plants really couldn't exist for all that long. And so we have a problem in regard to chronology. And so this third view would say, Look, we, it's, it's being a little poetic in the way it's telling the story. They would also point out that the word day in the Hebrew, the, the Hebrew word yom, actually doesn't always or very rarely means a 24-hour period in the book of Genesis and throughout the Old Testament. It's not, doesn't have to be pressed into that, that it can be an era, it can be an epoch. It literally could be four billion years if it needs to be, and that fits within the creation narrative. You know, they say that, you know, the, the moon is this many millions of years old, and then it was a rock, and it formed this. This view says, let's take all the scientific data and understand that it fits within the biblical story because God can create something on day two, and that could be 700 million years if it needs to be because the word day doesn't mean a 24-hour period. And of course, that makes sense because the sun and the moon weren't made the day three anyway. So you need a, day, a sun and a moon for there to be a 24-hour period. So what was going on day one and two? We didn't have a 24-hour period. So obviously that becomes a problem which then saves us, of course, from uh, the contradictions of the story. For instance, in Genesis 1, plants are made before human beings. In Genesis 2, human beings, Adam and Eve, are actually made before plants. So as you read Genesis, you got to read it in the right way. This group would say, so one scholar that commentates on the book of Genesis says, it's not to be read as a literal chronological uh, event, event, event form. It's actually a, a forming and then a filling that happens. So day one, light and darkness is created. And then day four is the sun and the moon and the stars, right? Day two is uh, the, the creation of water, oceans. Day five is fish and whales. Day three is he creates land. Day six, he creates animals and human beings. So he forms it day one, two, and three. He fills it day four, five, six, but there are to be parallels. So the whole point is this poetic, beautiful story that's telling you that 
This is how creation actually happened. And so the reality is we have to understand that we have to, this group would say, be humble in the same way that we would look at science and say, you've got to be humble because there's some data that's just not uber, uber clear. This group would say, you know, we have to be humble even before the biblical text and realize sometimes things aren't the way they seem on first reading. We got to do a little study. We got to recognize it's actually a flaw to out Bible the Bible, to push things, make the Bible say a whole bunch of stuff that it's actually not commenting on. One of the things that scholars tell us is the point of this story, when you pull back from it, is a critique on the actual pagan structures that existed at the time. That Babylonians, for instance, had a creation narrative that said that the stars and the certain planets were gods and you would worship them. And the Hebrews came along and they told this story where their God, Yahweh, in Genesis, it says he made the stars also. And in so doing, it's a critique on that pagan culture. It's saying, the thing you worship, our God made also on a, on a day, that it's a, that it's a worship story. It's not a story about every single detail of creation. It's about who do you worship in the end? Who do you give your life to? The God who makes creation or do you worship creation itself? That this is part of why the story is told and the way that it is told. So big idea is from this group humankind is connected to a common ancestry in a sense because they would say uh there was homo erectus back in the day you know caveman and at some point homo erectus became homo sapien thinking man in the latin and it, and that transition this group would say it's fine that, that actually all of science and archaeology tells us that the thing we call thinking rational man, human civilization, really only began maybe 60, 70,000, 50,000 years ago when we were actually being able to draw on walls and communicate and all of those things, that the Homo sapien version of humankind actually came into being in a similar timeline to what the Bible talks about, that maybe in that moment, the shift from this version to this version is the moment that Genesis 2 is talking about where they became rational people where God breathed into their nostrils and they became living souls. And so in that sense, we bear the image of God. It's not full on evolution because you're not jumping species. There is a critique from this camp on the evolutionary idea that it's uh, th that you see all these transitional models, which we'll, uh, I'll talk about in a second as a critique on evolution. It critiques that and says, no, actually, uh, most species retained within their, within their species. There was a literal Adam and Eve, whether they came out of this pre-existing group that looked human or not, that were whacking things around with sticks, maybe. And you also, though, in this group, you can get the billions of years. You can get the scientific conclusions of the day fit into the Bible because they don't press the Bible to be saying all these things literally. Now, let me give a few critiques on naturalistic evolution or just evolution in any form, uh, even theistic evolution. I'll give you a few critiques that are, that are, that are given that I think are, are legitimate, and then I'll conclude with a word about what I think this all means for our life. So I listed out a few critiques that scholars talk about. The first critique on naturalistic or theistic evolution is um, the lack of explanation for a first cause. So evolution doesn't have a great explanation for the origins of where this energy began. So they th theorize, they come up with all kinds of theories about how did this first amoeba cell, how did this thing get energy and start? And so there's all kinds of theories about a lightning bolt hit a pile of soup and then that created light and da -da -da -da, life and life then started maybe, but there really is no great explanation for the origin of life. That's critique number one. Critique number two is the complexity of something like the human eye, uh, the way it's built. You actually need it to almost be fully formed for it to actually work. Genesis also says that things were made according to their kind. So a fish produces a fish. A fish over time doesn't tend to produce a mammal. And Genesis seems to be retaining those categories. And you would assume, and this is one of the critiques, that if those transitional realities were true, that after 250, 300 years of digging around, that we would find millions of examples 
of all these transitional forms. You've seen the movie Crudes, maybe, or your kids have, you know, where you have all these, like, transitional forms. It's like half a, half a fish, and he's got, like, one eye, and he looks kind of like another, and they're, you know, it's like you would think there'd be a whole bunch of that actually in the ground, but there's not. In fact, uh, one writer has put it this way. He said, the fossil evidence clearly gives a picture of mature, fully functioning creatures suddenly appearing and staying very much the same. There is no indication that one form of life transforms into a completely different form. Stephen Jay Gould, who was an evolutionary biologist, atheist, he said this, the extreme rarity of transitional forms in the fossil record persists as the trade secret of paleontology. The evolutionary tree that adorns our textbooks has data only at the tips and nodes of their branches. The rest is inference. Basically, we have to just take what's here and then, you know, theoretically work back. But we're looking at the fossil record and you don't have a bunch of stuff that says, okay, here's this transitional form. We got layers and layers and layers. It's fully formed animals that make sense in their fully formed reality, which would seem to critique th one of the foundational issues of uh, evolution, which is why Darwin himself said this, why then is not every geological formation in every stratum full of such intermediate links? Geology assuredly does not reveal any such finely graduated organic chain. He says this, and this perhaps is the most obvious and gravest objection which can be urged against my theory. That if we never find these transitional forms, my theory is actually wrong. And so, Francis Crick, who's uh, the guy who you know, discovered the double helix, the DNA, he said this, when he's looking at the science, he recognizes that science does not contradict God in this major way. He says, an honest man armed with all the knowledge available to us now could only state that in some sense the origin of life appears at the moment to be almost a miracle. So many are the conditions which would have had to have been satisfied to get it going. Every time I write a paper on the origin of life, I say I will never write another one because there is too much speculation. So science itself recognizes without the transitional forms, without the geological data, this is actually a pretty hard theory to just take and say this is the way it actually happened. And so what's the conclusion to all this? Here's the thing. Humankind is made in the image of God versus a secular version of reality, which is there is no God. We just came from animals. If that was the case, then all kinds of naturalistic problems start arising. The idea that you have a moral compass that defies that you're just a product of nature. If you were just an animal, your moral compass would be vastly different. You would not see things in reality that bother you because your brain circuitry would only be a product of being an animal that made decisions for your own survival. Thus, it wouldn't bug you. A, a school shooting, this moral issue, that moral issue, pick your issue, racism, environmentalism. You might be really hopped up about these things, but it doesn't make sense to be hopped up about them if all you are is simply this phase of the animalistic evolutionary reality. Now, Here's the other thing. The beautiful thing about answering the question of why God made us in his image, whatever that means, whether it's taking an existing uh, version of, of, of Homo sapien and, and, and making them a rational creature when he breathed into them, or whether he made it fully formed on the day, Adam, here you go, whatever version, he made us in his image. And here's the beautiful part. Ask the question why. And in Jesus Christ, you see a very interesting answer. Why did God make us in his image? Because one day he wanted to come and fulfill what a human being was. He wanted to come as a human being, die on behalf of us because we were connected to the God that crafted us because of sin and rise again to give us life, to make us truly human. 
He made us in his image. And right at the end of the book of John, there's a beautiful image that Jesus is trying to bring back as an echo into the minds of his disciples and us as readers 2,000 years later. He stands in the room post-resurrection and looks at his disciples and breathes on them the Holy Spirit and then sends them out to mission. This is the creator standing in front of his people saying, you are my new humanity. You are what truly human is. And now I'm breathing on you in the context of new creation because of what I've brought about. Now go out and live a life of purpose. My question is, among all this debate, do you know that God? Do you know the God who made you in his image and actually crafted you for a purpose through the person and work of Jesus and allow him to actually breathe on you empowerment, joy, unto something in your life, unto purpose, unto meaning. Amidst all of this data, that would be my prayer for you. Father, I do pray that each person watching this at Connexus Church would take this information and let it hit their heart, not just their mind. That it would convict and call them to something amazing and beautiful in their life. That they would go on to reflect the image of God out into the world in a special way that calls men, women, and kids to believe in the God behind creation, whatever all the details are, that that would literally be our vocation and our calling in this world and that we would do it well. In Jesus' good name we pray, amen.